Everybody's getting real quiet. I know, I know. I'm just trying to follow the time thing so, you know, everybody can have that fellowship time. Page two, he said. <laughs> That's right. Well, I try to lower expectations so that anything, you know, gets better from there. So we're, we're going to talk about heaven today. We're heading down the home stretch of Revelation, and this is the best part. So we'll have our spiritual warm-up verse today, if you want to jot that down. Proverb, this is really something I thought about during my career a lot. I even had it posted on my cubicle there. This, this means a lot to me. Proverbs chapter 28, uh, verse 1. Uh, it, I didn't have it with me. It says, the, the, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous is bold as a lion. Now think about that in the course of police work think about it. the wicked flee when nobody pursues but the righteous are bold as a lion I've seen people run because they're guilty of something you don't know what it is but they're running they know so the conscience of the wicked person that's not anymore brother <laughs> well see it, it, he was fleeing when nobody was pursuing. That's it. That's, it. that's right. A perfect example. That's right. Well, we're in the final. Yes, sir. Mm hmm. We'll see how that works. That's right. Absolutely. See how that works out for him. Well, we're in chapter 21. And uh, just to have our thoughts go back to what we've been discussing together over the last few weeks is this. We're in the middle, in the midst of the Roman Empire. Of the many books that I've looked at and looking at these lessons, one was by W.B. West Jr. And I like the title of that book. And it's uh, Revelation Through First Century Glasses. So what I try to do uh, during preparation of these classes is to go back and look at things through their eyes because we know that the, the uh, message was sent to which churches? Seven churches, Seven churches of Asia. And uh, it was specifically sent to them. But if I ever had to do the class over, I would, I would emphasize this fact is that it's sent to everybody. We know that. It's sent to us just as much as it was today. But just as we have messages in the Bible that are specifically penned to people of specific times and places, like the epistles, it's all for us. And I always want to emphasize that. And, and as we proceed through the remaining two chapters of this book, we see that when we start to talk about heaven. And this affects Christians of all ages. So they were going through heavy, heavy persecution. Uh, some of the things I could have read in the class I didn't just, just because they were too horrible, the things that these people went through and the death. And they, the whole book is an encouragement to them that they're going to be victorious in the Lord and all the wicked will perish. That one day they'll receive the victory that's in Christ. And now, as we have studied together in these last few lessons that we see old things have passed away we begin to enter a heavenly scene now we've seen the false prophet go away the beast that mighty Roman empire that had such a bad influence on, on the people that were demanding the Christians to bow down and worship the emperor and also Satan we see that he was bound by the gospel and that he was to be loose for a little season. We talked about that last week. But ultimately, his destiny is in hell. And now we're presenting through the scenes of eternity. And I don't know, but this is one of the greatest subjects you could ever think about. It is. People think about vacations, going on vacations, and they prepare. And they look at what to expect. And the reason for the why do people go on vacations? Get away. From what? daily life and grind and things and they just for a moment they feel like they get away even though they still had the thoughts maybe of the old job that they're trying to escape from or whatever's bothering them it's still plaguing them in their mind but I would say heaven's an ultimate vacation 
it's a vacation for eternity. And it's a prepared place by our, our God. And when we escape to that place, there is no thought. And we'll see this shortly of anything that had troubled you before. And you're, you never have to have the thought of going back to the old way of thinking. You're never going back to work. You're there forever. And I know people have thought, I wish this vacation could last. Well, this is, this is the scene. And in chapter 21, we'll begin at verse 1. It says this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, there's been a doctrine taught. I don't necessarily agree with this, but people have, you know, different thoughts. And it's that of a reconstituted earth, that God will reconstruct this earth and will live on it, and that's the thought of heaven. That is a thought. But I don't believe that to be the case because of what's written in Second uh, Peter. Let me see if I can find that. Well, Second Peter chapter 3 talks about uh, that the world will be destroyed by what? Fire, fervent heat. And that the things here will pass away. They'll be consumed. There is no earth anymore. No more substance. And all things are made new. So I believe we're expecting a, a totally different spiritual home. And that's just my view of it and the way I see it. And that's in Second Peter, if you want to jot it down. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. For that reference of all things being consumed and burned. Verse 2 said, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now, who would be the bride of Christ? The church. Any passages come to mind about that immediately without being prepared for research? I've jotted some down. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. The church consists of the people. Sometimes in the world's eyes, what do you think they think about when they, when they hear the word church? Absolutely. And even I do. When, my first thought when somebody says the church, for some reason, I picture a building and a sign out front. That's not the biblical concept of the church. The church itself is who's in that building. Us. The ones that have obeyed the gospel and been added to the group of the saved. We see that first in Acts 2 and on the day of Pentecost. And also in Revelation it says in chapter 19 verses 6 through 8 says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. A purified people through the blood of Christ is the church. And John said he saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. The old Jerusalem was who? Who? Israelites, yes, that's right. It was a physical Israel, and we've talked about, especially in our study in Hebrews, how things of the Old Testament foreshadow things to come. And the church, we see comparisons with the old Israel, physical Israel, and the new Israel of today, which is the church. And now he sees the new Jerusalem, a holy city to itself. It's no longer things that are physical, but now it's spiritual, and it's prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. We think about John uh, chapter 14. He says, You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We spoke last week about the concept of betrothal period. And the groom has gone to prepare a place for his bride. And that's the way the, the, it spoke about in Scripture. That Christ has gone and promised to prepare a place for the bride. 
And this is what we see when we talk about heaven. So this is the new Jerusalem being talked about. And verse 3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What is symbolized in the tabernacle? Do you remember the tabernacle of old? A portable structure at that time, a place where God manifested himself, where worship was conducted, where the presence of God was said to be with the people. I always thought it was interesting when uh, Solomon went and dedicated the temple, not the tabernacle now, but the temple that he built, and dedicated to the Lord that he, he, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, I know that this building cannot contain you. Solomon in all his wisdom knew that the temple couldn't contain God. He was uncontainable. But we learn in the church that God is within the hearts, within the Christian. We're, we have him within us when we obey his teachings. The Spirit dwells in us when we hear the words of the Spirit. And they dwell in, in us so that they affect our lives and, and what we do. The tabernacle of God is the presence of God. And it says in verse 4, and this is what I would say would be a key verse in this chapter and perhaps the whole Bible because this really brings it home. That's what we were talking about earlier when we thought about the vacation. It says, And God sh shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, <clears throat> It says that he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And we've talked about, is, is the book of Revelation a literal book or a symbolic book? That's right, it was given in symbols. This is a symbolic picture here of God because we know that there won't be any tears in heaven. But it's showing that God wipes away the tears. It's showing he has the power to do away with all, all sorrow. That's the symbolism here that's shown. But look at what there is no more of. And if this can't motivate a person, I don't know what can. I'm motivated by fear a lot. Like I talked about that wild dog on the chain last week. That motivated me to run faster than I ever ran. But things that are so good and the concept of heaven for it not to mo motivate you, no more death. Death affects us. It affects us with our pets, with our loved ones. Death is always looming in this life. It was brought, brought to us during the first sin, and death ever since has been a plague on humanity. But now, for the Christians, the ones that needed, especially the ones that were hearing this, that were going through horrible deaths, terrible deaths, they were reading now, and they undoubtedly saw deaths of their loved ones. And they're told now there will be no more of that, neither sorrow. There's many things that bring about sorrow. What, what could you think of that brings about sorrow? Taxes. taxes. <laughs> no more taxes. All right, that's right. Absolutely. Well, it does. Anything that brings about sorrow. Anything you can conceive of. Sick family members that you can't do anything about. Sick family members that you can't do anything about. That's right. That's, Mitch says those that are lost and that you've tried and that, that uh, those thoughts aren't there anymore and what and Kathy you said something yeah. death and that, bingo that's, that's one of the biggest ones death but every one of those any others pain, pain. and that's going to be mentioned here specifically here absolutely it says nor crying so there's sorrow there's also weeping there's a difference. And just like we talked about the Word of God, you know, it's, it's uh, like a two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Even gets here between the very thought of crying and sorrow. There is a difference. And it says uh, the former things have passed away, but I, I failed to mention no more pain. There's probably pain being experienced right now in this room by, by people. A lot, maybe a lot of pain. Some people aren't with us because of tremendous pain today. Physical pain, emotional pain, 
I think about Paul too. He prayed three times for what? The, yes, yeah, it says the thorn in his flesh. And we don't know what that was exactly. Some have even thought it could be something with the eyes due to his blinding on the road to Damascus, but we don't know. But there was something that was plaguing him. Not anymore. Not anymore. So these former things have passed away. And verse 5 says, and he, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Completely new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Several times, and at the beginning of Revelation, John was admonished to write and record the things that are written in the book. But also, other times, and this is one where he's told to write again, makes you wonder what was happening during that time. Was it just written there for emphasis, or was John so caught up in what he was hearing, he, he failed to write? His attention was so on what was being said and the wonderful things that were said maybe he was reminded saying be sure you're writing that John you've been there before where your, your attention gets off on something else you forget to do what you're supposed to do that's just a thought we don't know but verse 6 it says and he said unto me it is done I am the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end well let's stop right there what, what do you think that's saying I know you know that what is Alpha and Omega? That's right. It's like saying I am the A and the Z, right? Beginning and end. But further thought, what do you think that's saying? When he says I'm the beginning and the end. That is, and I've read those exact same words. Richard said that he was the beginning of creation and he will be the end of it. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. The beginning and ending. Now, it could be he is the beginning of creation and the end of it. But also, it could reflect uh, the eternal nature of Christ. You know, God said uh, to Moses, or from the burning bush, before Abraham was, I am. And we're talking about that there's an eternal nature to God. We've talked about that before, that there is no time with God. Really and truly, we know things with beginnings and endings, but to God, there is no beginning and there is no ending. And our minds can't conceive of that. Just like as we'll talk about a little later in the book of Revelation, we'll see images of heaven, but they're given in descriptions we can understand. Not so certain that a human mind could understand all the things of heaven. So we'll look more at that when we see the description of it and then go back and review what Paul said when he was caught up of inexpressible words. But he said in verse 6, he said, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. And we'll see the water come up later. What could this mean? Living water. And what is there any particular story that comes to your attention when you, when you say that? Yes, the woman at the well. And he said, I have, Jesus told the woman, I have water that if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. This caught her attention. She said, I want some of that water. But what he was talking about was the gospel. What would be forgiveness of sins and that through Christ's blood, his sacrifice, she and everyone else that would obey him would live forever. So this spiritual water is the gospel. It's what, it, when we obey it, we can live forever. But he says that he would give, to him, uh, give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Some people aren't thirsty, are they? You've got to be thirsty. Blessed are those that, what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. He's not going to dump the water down your throat. You've got to want it. And, and, you, and that's, that's what it means to be a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. And he'll give to those freely that are a thirst of it. And those that are a thirst of it will do what it takes to get it. If he were to say bring a bucket to get, gather the water, you'd bring a bucket to gather the water. Whatever, whatever you needed to do upon his command, you would do it if you were really thirsty. 
a person really thirsty wouldn't turn down the method and a lot of times I think that's what we see when we see the teachings they're rejected are they really thirsty are they really searching for what they need to do or what I need to do verse 7 says he that overcometh shall inherit all things I will be his God and he shall be my son overcoming is a word that you see throughout the book overcoming and also endure endure things that are on this earth while we're living here have to be endured and if you do endure it you'll overcome it and what's on the other side is the victory they get for it and nobody could could understand this any more than the people it was written to if you literally saw the horrible deaths of people during this time and and not denying the Lord's name the words endure and overcome would mean a lot more to you just like those people that when the Lord taught that those that had the greater sin would love more they do when you realize you've been forgiven for things that are greater greater sins you become more humble and here for what these people experienced overcoming enduring meant everything to them so we're also to endure the things that Satan throws at us and we've talked about before we're in a spiritual battle Ephesians chapter 6 teaches it to don the armor of God and it's listed there because we're not in a physical war we're in a spiritual war and things we, there are things we just have to endure while on this earth and overcome it and verse 8 says but and he shows a contrast here He's showing the blessings of those that have endured and overcome, but now he's mentioning another group of people. It says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now we talked about the second death. I believe it was last week. And, you know, we talked about the first resurrection. The first resurrection is obedience to the gospel, obeying uh, the gospel in baptism, the actual reenactment of the gospel. And uh, these, these are the saved people. But, but it says here, the second death. Second death, everybody dies, right? But the second death is the one of the soul. And the ones that's taken part in the first resurrection have nothing to fear of the second death because their soul don't die the way the evil people's souls die in hell. But the very first thing on the list, we could go down here and you could study this for weeks, this list. And you're saying, please, Mike, don't. But it says the fearful. Now, as you think about these sins... Does it mean that anybody that's ever done these sins are doomed and they have no hope? Well, if that was the case, none of us would have a chance. But if they overcome, they do. Now, when I think about that because I think about Peter. Right? Peter is often... Poor Peter's brought up so much, and what a great man. But the Bible, which is a testament to it being from God, is that the fact it doesn't cover up the flaws of the heroes in the book. Peter, the man we look up to so much, it shows his flaw and the things that happened to him and how he overcome it. Now, Peter was fearful. For a moment there, he turned into a coward. That's a fact. Have we ever done that? Absolutely, but we, we pick on Peter. But here's the thing. Look at Peter's life. He overcame that. He preached the gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost. He penned the words found in Scripture. So that we must always press forward. That's what it teaches. But here's what it's talking about with this group of people. Those who refuse to repent. They won't change. They won't seek God. They live in things of the world and that's where they remain. And when I was reading this verse, I just thought about 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Another example. It says a man had his father's wife. 
But it te- it was teaching the, the uh, discipline, church discipline through it, but it said that deliver such a one to Satan that his soul may live in the day of judgment. In other words, there was hope for this man that was doing something very perverse. But if he would repent, and God knows the heart, then he could still be saved. So it is with all the, the, the types of sins that are listed here. As long as people have a breath, they can repent of it. But, but these are showing people that have refused and rebelled against God and remain that way. And they do experience the second death. A horrible scene. And verse 9 says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues. We saw, as, as we thought it was, the, the destruction and judgment of Rome. Rome was judged. It ultimately fell, but this is also just a preview of eternal judgment and the fall of all mankind. And it says, And talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the pride, the Lamb's wife. Now, the former things have passed away. When, 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 when the bride comes down, there's no earth to go to. This is a heavenly scene. This is, this is interesting language because it looks like the Lamb's wife is a city about to be described. And some commentators completely skip over that. I only found a few that even tried to address that. But what is a city really made up of? The people in it. When we say America is great, what do we mean? It's 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 all, a country is only as good as the people that are in it. And so it is with heaven and and this scene here. He's saying, "I'll show you the church," and what it's showing is the church in the glorified scene, where they ended up, and that that's heaven. And it says in verse ten. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now it's the holy Jerusalem. Jerusalem had rebelled against God in the past, the earthly Jerusalem. Now it's showing a holy Jerusalem, the church, the one that's been purified by the blood of Christ. And it says this, and then it then begins the description of heaven in, in verse 11. It says, Having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now what, what is clear? What does that may represent? Clear. Purity. Purity. That's right. Purity. And not the milk. Did you get that? No. And, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels. And the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Now, once again, uh, Paul in Second Corinthians chapter twelve speaks of being the man that went to heaven, whether by vision or taken in person. He didn't know, and he said he he observed things that were unlawful for man to utter. That's an interesting passage because. It seems that what he saw, they couldn't describe. And that's why I think that a lot of the the teachings about the reconstituted earth, we would know the things that were on earth. But let's just think about what Paul said for there for a second. Now, just personally, I've told you this before. I have a problem with a sensation that that comes in my feet. There's a thing called restless leg syndrome. And what it is to me is just an awful feeling. And I can't describe it. It's a frustrating thing when somebody says, what, what is it? Is it pain? And I say, no, I can't describe it. I think they think that I, I'm, I'm just trying not to tell them, but I can't, I don't have a word. There's nothing that, that's ever come up where I can say, well, it's this. Well, it's numbness. No, it's not that. It's pain. Not that. Creepy crawly feeling. Not that. It's getting close. Tingling? Not quite. So people are thinking, you're messing with me, Mike, you know. But it's true. There's not a word for it, and I can't describe it to you. And Paul... 
restless. <laughs> but, but the restless leg just affects my feet. Sometimes I feel in the hands. I take medicine for it. That's what's wrong with me. Uh, but, but the thing about it is, it's inexpressible. And Paul was saying when he saw this vision of heaven, it was inexpressible words. So it is here, when, I just want to keep in mind when we're reading this, this is a description of things that we know and are beautiful. The ultimate beauty and joy of heaven is not even conceived of. We don't even know what kind of words to describe it by. Yeah, I'm missing the... I'm, yes, sir. Man's tongue can't speak something like that because we, we don't know what... We've never seen nothing. That's right, Richard said. There's nothing we've seen of it. I, I remember the... Pa I can't quite get the passage. Somebody may help me with it. But it talks about nothing has entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. In other words... You don't even have a, a taste of it. Not even a taste. But anyway, it says this. Uh, let's see where we were. Verse 12. Okay. And had a wall great and high, and twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Now we've talked about that number, 144,000, in previous lessons. And I'm not telling you proof positive, but... 12 appears to be a number associated with the organized religion. When you have 12 tribes of uh, Israel that symbolize the faithful of the old covenant and the 12 apostles on what the, that had the large impact we'll read about later on the proclamation of the gospel, you have 12s and 12s of obedient people and 1,000 being the number of completeness that we've discussed. 12 times 12, 144, and times 1,000, 144,000. You get to see these are the saved of all times. So you have the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. It says on, in verse 13, on the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. It just so happens, you know, three is a number of the divine. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There the 12 apostles appear. We see the 12 tribes of Israel, and now the 12 apostles. And what an impact the apostles had on Christianity. Christ said that he had to go, but what was to come after Christ? the Holy Spirit a comforter to those apostles and he told them and you can read about this in John 14 and 16 don't worry what you're going to say when they bring you for people because in that hour it will be given to you the Spirit spoke through the apostles they were what you what some people have termed walking New Testaments they didn't have the completed revelation of God at that time but apostles being given power by the Holy Spirit to perform signs and miracles and authenticate what they were saying and they proclaimed the words of God because the power was with them and when people saw that power they knew they could believe they were from God and not only what they said but what they wrote so we had the recorded words of those inspired apostles and that's where the foundation of Christianity lies and 15 says and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof Gold has to do with royalty, and walls, believe it or not, they have to do with security. Now, in our society today, we hear walls don't work. Well, they do if, if they're built and they're guarded. Why would a wall be symbolizing? What, what does walls do? That's right. The, yes. There's always a separation between the just and the unjust, and in the end of time we see separation. When the rich man Lazarus, we talked about a great gulf, but this wall separates, and it protects. It's, it's a symbolic scene. It appears to me that the people inside the church have, are forevermore protected in that city. It says in 16, the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and breadth, and the height of it are equal. I read once, I wrote you, read you a passage out of Burton Kaufman's commentary, and I looked at what he wrote 